Boeing, ladies and gentlemen. We are in day two of this conference. Yesterday, of course, we heard of the strategic challenge that China poses to India in various domains, you know, security, uh, perhaps trade, global standing, even in water. Uh, today we will continue with the theme. So you have a fair idea of the background and the context. Today we continue with bilateral investments, problems and prospects. We have two speakers here. Mr. Harshvi Podar, who is the executive director of Podar Family Holdings, who will speak about how um, trends and gaps in India-China investment ties and what are the challenges. So over to you, Mr. Podar. You have been starting now. You have 20 minutes. Good morning, everyone. I would like to, I hope uh, you'll have had a good uh, discussion yesterday. And thank you all so much all for coming. Uh, the, the subject that we're discussing today, bilateral investment, trends and gaps in India-China investment ties, the challenges and opportunities thereof, is a very important subject. Over the last very many years, I've had the fortune of being able to travel extensively in China and having done business over there. Uh, I spent some, uh, many years in the US and in China, moved back to India a few years ago. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to get immersed extensively in uh, the Chinese uh, culture and the way of life while living in China. There's a couple of things which I think is very important for anyone to understand before we start delving deeper into understanding China and understanding the precarious India-China relationship that exists and also understanding the ways in which we can strengthen that relationship. The, an interesting parallel I want to draw here, which I have mentioned a few times before, is that from my travels in Japan and China, I noticed a very sharp contrast in the cultures of the two countries. Japan tends to be a very uh, exclusive culture in the sense that it doesn't necessarily absorb uh, everything around it into its sphere. Uh, I'll give you an example. In Japan, there are three scripts when you write the Japanese language. The first one is the, the Chinese characters which they use when to uh, write. And the other two scripts are hiragana and katagana. And uh, hiragana is a script which is used, which is a phonetic script. The Chinese characters is more of a pictorial script. And hiragana is a phonetic script where you look at the, uh, you pronounce the words as the script goes. And uh, you use it for proper nouns. But then for anything which is non-Japanese, a proper noun which is not of Japanese origin, they have a separate script called katagana, which is mostly used for foreign names. And they're very particular what forms, which, what, uh, sort of names and things are part of uh, the Japanese heritage which should come under hiragana, what should come under katagana. I mean one interesting example, Alberto Fujimori who was uh, president of uh, Peru uh, is of Japanese origin but his name is always written in katagana. So he's not considered Japanese despite being of Japanese origin. Uh, the Chinese on the other hand has a culture which is extremely inclusive. Inclusive in the sense that they like to absorb everything within their own sphere. When I was living in China, I'll give you an example. Uh, the Apple computer company, it's called Pinguo in China, which is the Chinese word for the word Apple. Anyone who goes and spends some time in China is inevitably given a Chinese name by which that person is addressed locally. So the culture, the historic culture of uh, China is that of extending the Chinese influence, the Chinese uh, uh, way of life, the Chinese uh, so society, onto anyone who is considered foreign, and uh, uh, there's a proce process of signification that one goes through one when one starts working very closely with China. The interesting part about the Indian and Chinese cultures are that both are very primary uh, sources of. Uh, history and culture in the world, in the sense that both have their own subcultures. There's a great Indian subculture that exists where the Indian diaspora is spread across Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. Similar Chinese subcultures that exist in different parts of China. Uh, the language, the architecture, the visual arts, philosophy, 
region, politics, history of all of these, uh, uh, the Indian and Chinese cultures have originated on their own uh, without significant influence. I mean, there have been significant influences from outside, but it is not something which you could consider a subculture. You would consider each of these to be supercultures. And uh, there is a continuous jostling that exists for influence, admiration, respect, etc. And uh, Indian culture is also very, very inclusive. Uh, very, it has historically absorbed all the different cultures that it has uh, been uh, in contact with uh, throughout the course of history. So, this national uh, character of the Indian and Chinese uh, uh, civilizations create a an inherent undercurrent of uh, competition. Competition for influence, competition for admiration and respect, competition for extending the sphere of influence, so to speak. Now when we speak about the Indian and Chinese economies, there's a couple of points I want to make. And the importance of the Indian and Chinese economies can never be understated. I mean, India and China together constitute about 25% of humanity. Very important uh, in, in the sense that they constitute, so, they represent so many people, they are very large economies, powerful, strong. And uh, the interaction between these, the relationship between India and China can never be overemphasized. As the Chinese economy has grown, the companies have become larger, the economy has become larger. There has been a great amount of internationalization that has happened in the Chinese economy. There are two uh, points I want to make here. The first one is that of the 13 year gap. There was a very interesting study which I had read uh, a few years ago in which uh, they compared the Indian economy after liberalization in 1991 with that of the Chinese economy when it liberalized in 1978. Before that, both economies tended to be mostly very closed in nature. There was not too much of uh, foreign investment. There were ebbs and flows, of course, uh, in India, but Chinese economy was, was mostly closed uh, from the perspective of, uh, uh, you know, uh, foreigners' involvement in the Chinese economy, in the Chinese culture. And, uh, uh, and, and then these researchers from Bloomberg, they plotted a graph. On the x-axis was the number of years since liberalization. And on the y-axis was different measures of economic growth. GDP growth, foreign investment growth, export growth, investment in infrastructure, etc., etc. And it was uncanny the correlation between the growth rates and the number of years since liberalization between the Indian and the Chinese economies. That means the score of growth which China started off with after liberalization is very similar to the growth which India experienced after it liberalized. It's almost 99% correlation. I was very surprised to read that. And what that means if we naively extrapolate the data is that there is a 13 year gap that exists. India liberalized its economy 13 years after China and hence started uh, enjoying the fruits of liberalization in the form of economic growth and more companies and all of that. And in the last 13 years it has been transformative from China from China's perspective. If you look at China's economy, it's 2018 now and 2005. If you look at the size of their companies, if you look at the, uh, the nature of their companies in terms of their R&D and all of these things, if you look at the internationalization of the number of Chinese companies with international operations, if you look at all the different aspects of the Chinese economy, it is a fairly different uh, level now compared to what it was 13 years ago. So the last 13 years have been, uh, has been an era in which the order of magnitude of everything in China has changed. Similar has been the case with India in the last 13 years, a lot has happened in India as well. The uh, next 13 years, if we extrapolate from the data, it can be a decade of complete transformation from, an in, from India's perspective also. So this 13 year gap uh, suggests that India is exactly 13 years behind China uh, as far as the economy and growth and all of these things are concerned. The second point I want to make is the inter internationalization of the Chinese economy when Chinese companies became large, when they became mature, when they started having strengths of their own and they started 
having global ambitions, started going international, started buying companies and building their own offices in, uh, in other areas, they faced a lot of challenges. Lack of experience in building global brands, a lack of knowledge of consumers, things of that sort. And they had, they, I mean, we've all heard of so many stories of Chinese companies overpaying for assets abroad and having trouble with managing these assets. There were challenges with corporate governance, uh, you know, stock market listings which went well, some went, which went poorly. Uh, so, China has, over the last 10 or 15 years, through its experiences, been able to create some very large good global companies. One example of a case study is Lenovo. Lenovo is a local Chinese company which was started in the year 1984. It started with 10 engineers with about 2 lakh yuan of capital, small little company and it started off as a local company to import computers and distribute it within China, distribute and install computers. They had a lot of uh, you know failed experiences as they grew their company, I mean they uh, started an import and distribution of television business which failed, they started an import and distribution of watches which failed and finally they met their first success and they developed a circuit board for the first time to work with IBM computers uh, which could take Chinese characters as inputs. As uh, 1990 onwards they created their own brand, Lenovo initially was known as Legend in China and then the founders had a, a, a zeal to be to create to be different to create a global enterprise. I mean, what's one of the few Chinese companies which speaks English in its offices, as opposed to Mandarin being the main method of communication. And uh, they renamed the company when they started or when they uh, when they were growing in the 1990s as Lenovo, Li, which stands for the old name Legend, and Novo, which is Latin for new, to symbolize a new spate of growth and ambition. As an example of a Chinese company which wanted to go abroad. And the Lenovo is an example of a company which has become so significant in the global scale. Uh, in 2015, it acquired the international computers business of IBM. So you don't find IBM ThinkPad laptops anymore. It's all Lenovo ThinkPad laptops. Uh, and when they were acquiring this iconic brand in the US, there was a lot of pessimism. There was a lot of skepticism. The US government opposed the deal. A lot of the people who were being acquired by a Chinese firm had no idea what to expect. They were very skeptical of being uh, a part of a Chinese enterprise, they didn't know what to expect in terms of management, in terms of culture. And uh, it has been a very good example of a local small Chinese company which has transformed itself and become significant on a global scale. Right now, uh, Lenovo draws about 73% of its revenues outside of China. It is about $70 billion in revenue. I'll give you an example. Lenovo is not even one of the largest companies in China. I mean, it's a relatively small private company in China, $70 billion in revenue. The largest company in India is Indian Oil Corporation, which in the year 2016-17 posted revenues of $53 billion. So the largest company in India is smaller than a puny private company in China. The second largest company in India in terms of revenues reliance industry is $46 billion. State Bank of India third largest, $41 billion. So look at the size of the companies we're speaking of here. The largest companies in India in the 40s and $50 billion. The largest one is $53 billion. Let's look at some of the largest companies in China. The largest company in China is the State Grid Corporation, which is an electricity distribution company owned by the government. A turnover of $315 billion. Second largest company is Sinopec, which is an oil company, $267 billion. China National Petroleum Corporation, $262 billion. And ICBC Bank, $150 billion. The largest companies in China are in order of maggots three or four or five times larger than the largest companies in India. This speaks a lot about the level of maturity and the size and scale of the Chinese market and the level of development of their corporations in the business landscape. India and China have very similar populations. We both have a billion plus people. Both countries tout their demographic dividend that we have so many people, we are such a large market. But in reality, there exists a significant gap between the development of these markets. And since we are talking about investment as a means to promote greater relationships between India and China, and investment is something which is important because it forces interaction between the two peoples, uh, the peoples of the two countries. It forces investments, it forces permanent establishments in each other's countries. Uh, but touting, I mean, since we are talking about investment, promoting investment just 
for the, uh, you know, just by creating policies. I mean, we are discussing here how we can promote bilateral investment between India and China, allowing or encouraging Chinese companies from coming and investing in India, and uh, uh, making it conducive for Indian companies to invest in China, so as to strengthen the relationship from a strategic perspective between the two countries. I think the question that we ask needs to be turned on its head. I believe that in any capitalistic environment, and believe me, the Chinese companies, most of them which exist, are extremely capitalistic despite being operating in a so-called communist environment. They're extremely capitalistic and they uh, you know, are as profit-seeking as any other Chinese, any other corporation around the world. So they are all driven by economic interests. I mean, economic interests to generate profits, to you know, expand their businesses overseas, enhance the, uh, the depth and the, uh, and the quality of their management. The Indian companies in the Indian market simply does not compare. At this point in time, it's not attractive enough for a lot of foreign companies to come in, just because of the size and scale. And if we're trying to promote investment in India, one cannot go about uh, with a begging bowl around the, around the world and asking uh, countries to invest in India simply for the sake of investment or for the sake of strategic uh, enhancement of uh, you know, relationships between uh, India and other countries. I think the best way to demonstrate the strength of the Indian economy and the strength of the Indian marketplace, the quality of the Indian so-called so -called demographic dividend, is to foster an environment within our own borders where we ourselves are able to create companies which are attractive and which command admiration from other countries and companies around the world. Let us look at you know, some of the countries around the world and why they are admired. I mean, if you look around the world, what is it about a country or a company that uh, makes it command respect? Why is Singapore admired? Why is the UK admired? Why is the USA admired? What, what about Japan? What about China? What about Korea? What about Taiwan? These are countries which for some reason, some aspect of what they do, command a lot of respect internationally. Uh, Singapore, despite being a small country, is uh, respected for the financial uh, services uh, landscape that they've been able to create. Uh, the UK, because of its historical uh, uh, tech technologies which they developed during the Industrial Revolution in the colonial days, the USA because of the uh, dynamic corporations and large corporations that they've created, Japan for its precision engineering, German for a similar reason, Taiwan because of its focus on semiconductors, they've been able to create some of the best semiconductor companies in the world, China because of the scale and the low cost at which they're able to manufacture a lot of the smaller mundane goods that are available around the world, Korea for its heavy engineering. So what we find is a lot of these countries which have been able to command respect internationally or admiration have been able to focus on something which is their area of strength, some area which is uh, in you know, their niche and they've, become, they've been able to become global leaders in something. Be the best in whatever they're doing, pick an area which they're good at which are uh, conducive to their strengths and uh, be the best at that. Which means that we can't be all things, you can't be all things to everyone. Drawing from those lessons, uh, India will, India has to, we can do a lot to be able to create uh, our own national champions, not necessarily government owned but private companies and uh, be able to create policies so that our own companies can command admiration and respect internationally in whatever fields we operate in. That itself when we have case studies of companies in India which are doing so well, which are doing uh, which are which have been able to uh, do things at a scale and a scope which matches uh, uh, you know global standards will automatically uh, be a, a role model for a lot of countries and companies which want to come in and invest in India. Then we will be able to command and, uh, and bring in investment from a position of strength as opposed to a position of weakness. Uh, I'll give you another example from my own experiences doing business in different parts of the world. Wherever I travel in the world and all the business people that I meet, oftentimes when I meet with smaller companies in any part in Europe, in other parts of Asia, they often say that some of these large companies that exist, it's very hard to compete with them. I mean, we are small guys, we run small companies, it's hard to compete with the big companies. The big companies have great infrastructure, they have great staff, they have investments in technology, R&D, it's impossible to compete with the big guys, so as small guys we have our own little niches in which we operate. But when we speak to businessmen here in India, you hear almost the opposite. It's very surprising when I move back to India. Uh, you talk to the big companies and they say it's very hard to compete with the small companies over here. 
because they don't have to pay taxes, they don't have, you know, labor, they don't have to comply with all of these different labor laws. Uh, I mean, so many different things in which the, the playing field is skewed towards smaller companies. It's difficult to be a larger company in India. It's not that the economies of scale are not naturally available to larger companies. Because of our historic social, uh, socialist so policies, uh, which have been, uh, which are now being uh, transformed into uh, things which uh, are conducive towards creating large companies. India has the largest proportion of perhaps SMEs in the corporate landscape uh, in the, uh, as compared to most other economies of the world. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that if we are able to create large companies in India, which themselves are role models of, uh, of the large corporation, of, uh, of companies which demonstrate through its own size, capacity, scale, the uh, size of the Indian market, the quality of its demographic dividend, then we will automatically have companies which have the risk-taking ability, which have the management bandwidth to be able to acquire companies and expand their businesses in other parts of the world, very similar to what Chinese companies have been able to do, and also uh, be, uh, be attractive, uh, demonstrate the quality of the Indian market and attract investment from other parts of the world. Uh, I would uh, like to very quickly uh, summarize by uh, Emphasizing the the Indian, I mean, the importance of investment in uh, uh, in promoting uh, the relationships between India and China and other parts of the world. Uh, despite all of the challenges that we face, I express a great amount of hope in the Indian uh, economic. I mean, the next 13 years, the 13-year gap that we spoke about is going to be, I mean, the next 13 years are going to be very, very transformative for India. And uh, all of the countries and all the companies operating uh, can expect a major transformation. And if we have the right amount, right policies, uh, we will be able to attract a great amount of uh, uh, investment uh, and uh, growth and trade and be able to present ourselves from a position of strength in the global uh, scheme of things. Uh, lastly, I also wanted to add a little bit, you know, a small story which I add almost every time, highlighting the strength of the Indian culture. The strength of the Indian culture and the Indian economy and the and, and India lies in its inclusiveness, lies in its ability to uh, assimilate and take into account the opinions and the experiences and the desires of all the myriad people which con which constitute the Indian diaspora and the uh, and the Indian uh, population. And uh, I wanted to, I mean, this story is a story about what is it about China uh, that, uh, I mean, the greatest challenge which China faces is internal, in the sense of its own political and economic structures. Uh, the greatest challenge that China faces is in its ability to sustain its system of governance, which is based on a degree of separation between the ruling class and the commercially minded uh, ruled class. Uh, there's an old uh, quote. There's an old uh, a story about a person who was leaving China forever and at the, uh, at the immigration counter, the person asked him why are you leaving China and uh, he said that, uh, uh, you know, so the immigration officer asked him, so why are you leaving this country? This is your motherland. Are you unhappy with the living conditions in this country? And he says, no, I'm very happy with the living conditions in this country. He says, are you unhappy with the work and pay that you get in this country? He says, no, I'm very satisfied with the work and pay in this country. And he says, are you dissatisfied with the political leadership of this country? And he says, no, I'm very satisfied with the political leadership of this country. And he says, why are you leaving this country? And he says, I want to leave this country because I want to go to a country where I am allowed to be dissatisfied. And, uh, you know, that is an example of the strength that our country has where uh, we uh, are able to take into account the opinions of everybody else. And uh, with that, uh, I, would, uh, I would like to end my Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, some very interesting points. Extending, first point you made was China's civilization, things of self in terms of extending its influence. Now, how that translates in terms of extending and projecting power is something that will remain a question uh, to be answered by us. The other key point is need to be liked. Like Indians, they also want to have a very good image abroad. Now, can that be a moderating factor in what it does? Because it also wants to be liked by its neighbors, uh, which it also threatens. 
So that's a contradiction that uh, we will have to seek and look at answers. Large corporations, that's well known, you just look at Fortune 500, uh, just look at the list of the biggest companies, whether banks, uh, hydropower companies, electric utilities. I think the top three are now Chinese companies. Uh, that's absolutely right. And the point he made about scale, ultimately investments will come to India. Either the domestic market is very attractive or you become so attractive in terms of the conditions you create for manufacturing for the rest of the world. Now, unfortunately, on both these counts, we are not, we are below par right now, let's put it this way. Uh, and our policies, for some reason or the other, even new policies, does skew the landscape in favor of smaller operations. Just look at GST, which is supposed to be universal, one tax. We have already created a threshold of 20 lakhs below which you neither your compliance burden is much less. So, there is, you have built in an incentive to either under-report your tr turnover, or split your businesses so that you remain below 20 lakhs. So these are things, and of course, the definition of small, medium, and uh, micro enterprises in India, literally in the global context, all of them would only qualify to be micro. Actually, small is very, very small. Uh, it's smaller than the smallest. And so small scale industries, because of the labor laws, etc., also have no incentive to grow. So that is why if you see large, Small industries tend to be family-owned industries in India rather than actually creating uh, on scale. Uh, and of course, the key difference in this is that I think our policies have focused primarily on the process, how correct we are, rather than on the outcome. Well, the Chinese focus the other way around. I think they know what the outcome is, and uh, they will tweak their own process to reach, reach that outcome. I think that is a change that we'll have to do at the mindset level in the government. So thank you very much. We have, uh, of course, Mr. Mr. Ravi Bhutalingam, who's fellow of the Royal Geographical Society in London. He's also treasurer and honorary fellow of the Indian Institute of Chinese Studies in Delhi, which I must say is perhaps one of the most active think tanks in Delhi. In fact, uh, uh, only problem is they're located in civil lines where most of their events take place. So though they have Practically every day there is an event and, and, and significant event on China. Uh, most of us are unable to go unless they hold it in the Habitat Center. Uh, he is going to talk to us about how economic engagement with China can accelerate India's development. Uh, of course, uh, everybody knows that. What we would also like to hear, why that economic engagement in terms of investments at least uh, is not happening. Uh, is that part of the policy? Is it by design or accident or unattractiveness of Indian market? Uh, so the floor is yours, Mr. Mutlingam. You have 20 minutes. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you, General Roy and the organizers <coughs> for inviting me to this important uh, seminar. It's always good to be back in Calcutta. I spent 10 years of my life here and have very pleasant memories of the city. Now. My subject, how China can accelerate India's development, um, is one which is important for two reasons. One, India needs to grow at, at least 8 to 10 percent for the next 25 to 30 years for our own sake, for the sake of the people of India, for prosperity and for development. And the second, subsidiary reason why India needs to grow at that rate is that that is the only thing that will guarantee, and I use the word guarantee advisedly, India being in a position of not being dominated by any country including China. You don't need to be equal in size or equal in economy not to be dominated, but you need to have a general proportionality. After all, China is not equal to the US, but is big enough and powerful enough to have a situation of a certain amount of balance. So how is India going to grow at 8 to 10 percent constantly for the next 25 or 30 years is the question we have to answer for both these reasons. Now I put it to you that China is important for 
India to achieve this in four specific ways which I am going to spell out. And China will not be doing any charity <coughs> in operating these four specific ways. It will do so because it, it is also in China's self-interest. I will come to that too. But before that, let me address a more fundamental <coughs> question. Why should countries which are rivals and competitors and engage increasingly in a situation where there have been incidents over the last few years. Why should they engage with each other in this intensive manner? Doesn't it sound counterintuitive? No. If you go back in history from the Second World War onwards, you find this has been happening all the time. Every single country that has arisen and become an economic power after the Second World War has done so by engaging with other countries that were either its former enemies or indeed are its current adversaries. You take Germany and Japan, defeated after the Second World War, engaged strongly with the United States and that permitted them to rise rapidly. When Japan started rising, in turn, Japanese investment and trade in turn helped Korea and the East Asian Tigers to rise. And Korea, remember, was a former colony of Japan and the other smaller countries had been its adversaries in the war. When China started its development, the initial phase was China was enormously helped by Japanese investment in technology and later followed by the East Asian Tigers and the United States itself its current adversary and rival to come to the phase of the ASEAN countries rising. ASEAN engaged not only with Japan, who had invaded them in the Second World War, but China, which has got many issues with ASEAN countries and of course with, with America. So you see in a pattern in all this, that if a country has to come up economically, they must trade, have investment relations, tourism, everything, with an open heart with countries with whom their relations might be on a variety of planks, some of them adversely, some of them with rivalry, and they will learn to manage that. Now, is there a secret to managing it? I will come to that a little later. So, managing competition, rivalry, cooperation on a multi-dimensional platform is very important for India to learn, not only with China, but with other countries. But with China, it is particularly important because, as I said, there are four ways in which economic engagement with China can help India accelerate its growth. The first is investment. My friend just now spoke about it. China has got more than three trillion worth of free reserves. That money is now earning a pitiful return in US Treasury bonds. Chinese, like anybody else, want good returns for their investment. Where is it possible? Increasingly, Chinese investment, if you see it around the world, is in risky parts of the world. In Africa, in Central Asia now they want to go with the Belt and Road. All these countries of high risk profiles. India, in contrast, has not only got a large market, it has got a, a good judiciary, though a bit slow moving, it is politically stable. Yes, it is not an easy country to do business yet. But the Chinese are used to that. The countries they do business with are sometimes even more difficult. The size of the Indian market, the potentiality of the Indian market, take cell phones. 900 million people have got cell phones. India is a huge market. So, India is a huge market. There is a potential for making profit, which of course I agree 
with Mr. Poda. That is what Chinese businessmen, like all businessmen, want. Chinese are used to adversity and operating in adverse markets, including their own when it started. It started as a communist country with no conception of a free market. Now, of course, it's very different. They are good learners. So they are, have a capability to learn. The other thing about investment is that investment generates growth. If the Chinese invested just 1% of their reserves, not much, $30 billion, $30 billion of investment would increase our growth rate by about 0.3 to 0.4% our GDP growth rate, not to be sniffed at. Then, the other thing is that Chinese investment can greatly increase the rate of employment in our economy. And that is something we solely need. Jobs is what everybody is talking about. What is happening in China is that the middle tech and low tech industries like leather and toys and shoes and garments are moving out of China because China has become too expensive for those factories. But where are they going? They're going to Vietnam, they're going to Laos, they're going to Myanmar, they're coming to our neighbor Bangladesh. Bangladesh today leads India in garment exports, something which would have been unthinkable five years ago. And these are the industries that create semi-skilled employment which is what we need. But why aren't they coming here? If they came here, they could hugely increase employment. Incidentally, investment in any, in any way, whether in infrastructure or in garment type employment, does one other thing. Investment is a capital infusion, so it also reduces the trade deficit. A positive capital infusion counteracts on the capital account what is a trade deficit on our revenue account. And as you know, trade deficit with China is something about which we are quite worried. So this is another reason why we should have investment. The third area where economic relations with China are very important is tourism. We get only 200,000 tourists from China out of 10 million foreign tourists who come to India. And out of 120 million Chinese tourists who go abroad. Now, is this what should be happening between two nations of a billion plus population? If we could step that up to 10 times 2 million, which is easily possible, we could shave another 4 or 5 billion dollars off our trade deficit because tourism income again is an inflow. And of course, finally, the fourth area is technology. It is now the East which is going to lead in technology. The US, of course, is a great leader. But China, Korea, Japan are going to be the new leaders. Japan and Korea are already there. But China is going to be a major point of innovation in future which we will do well to engage with. So, these are the four areas through which Indian development can very significantly increase. And these are obviously the areas that we should focus on. Now, let me come to the point that the chairman raised very pertinently. All this sounds very sensible, but why is it not happening? That's the question he asked. Now, there are two parts to that question. Why is it not happening in general terms? Because it's not just a problem with Chinese investment or others. It's a general problem which is known as ease of doing business. I'm not going to go into that because it's a subject in itself. But that is one aspect of it. The other aspect relates to the mindset in dealing with China. And this goes back to my first point, that Japan, Korea, ASEAN, etc. came up with a mindset 
of dealing with rivals and competitors and former enemies despite problems and even despite problems with current adversaries, but they engage economically. If they can do that, why can't we? The answer to this I would like to offer to you, and we will have a discussion when during the question hour, is what in, is a psychological conundrum. And I want to put it to you this way. It is an incentive motivation problem. If you want somebody to do a piece of work, there are three strategies you can adopt broadly. One is you say, fulfill this target and I will give you a reward. This is known as positive motivation. Fulfill this target and I will give you a lakh of rupees. This is what business people throughout the world use. This is a commonly used business model. But does it work? Experience shows that it's about 50-50 the results. What happens is people are more interested in the one lakh rather than doing the work. So they start off very enthusiastically going after the target but after a while they start gaming the system and start fiddling and cheating how to get the lack without doing the work. And the results you can see evident most dramatically in the world economic crisis of 2008 and 9, where very highly paid bankers and analysts cheated millions of people by gaming the system at great profit to themselves. So positive motivation is a mixed record. What about negative motivation? Negative motivation work, works like this. Full this. Fulfill this target, otherwise I will shoot you. Now, the results with negative motivation are, it works quite well with simple tasks. If you say, go and cut down this tree, or get me a glass of water, negative motivation works quite well, but not for complex tasks. If you say, invent a cure for cancer, otherwise I'll shoot you, it's not going to work. So in the modern era, it has got very limited use. There is a third method, which is not much used by companies because it is somewhat unpleasant. But it is used largely by countries, and this is what all these countries use. And this is called positive negative motivation. Positive negative motivation works like this it starts with motivation like the first category, saying, Hey, here is a target, go after it, and I will give you not one lakh, but five lakh. So the person starts working very hard, as he would. And as you remember in the first case, they do that very enthusiastically to start with. But unlike the first case, in this third case, about one third of the way through that, the person says, hey, wait a minute, you've done a great job, I'm very happy with you. And so, you know what, I'm going to give you the five lakhs straight away, but on one condition. If you don't fulfill the target, I'm going to take this five lakhs back. Now, this creates a very, very strong motivation because in behavioral science, there is something called loss aversion. You feel a greater sense of loss at losing a hundred rupees than as the same sense of happiness or gain at gaining hundred rupees. It's a very uh, strong psychological rule which has been proven time and again, including by Richard Thaler, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics just last year and, and who is an advisor to the government of India. So applying the principle of loss aversion, offer this incentive as a positive incentive. Somewhere up, down the line you change it to a negative incentive and so the person is engage in it and then strongly incentivize not to pull back. This is what all these countries did. What they say is, come and trade with us. 
come and invest, come and do business. Our doors are open. And they said that to friend and foe alike. They all came. Once they came and they engaged in this mesh of interests of trade, investment, tourism, students, etc. The interdependence was so great that they couldn't, couldn't pull out. So actually, the trick is, you don't need to use a negative mechanism. China has invested 800 billion worth in US Treasury bonds. Now, the US could, China could sell those 800 billion bonds and cause a lot of trouble for the US, but at great cost to itself. So, there is interdependence. So they, China is holding a gun to the US head, but the gun is also pointed the other way. So that's what this positive negative motivation does. It enmeshes you in such a way it's very difficult for you then to create serious damage because then you hurt yourself also. So I would suggest this strategy, answering the chairman's very interesting and pointed question. That what we should do is engage with China in a very wholehearted way, as Japan has done, as Singapore is doing, as ASEAN is doing. Take the normal precautions, but recognize that investment, trade, tourism, student exchange, technology from everywhere is welcome and important for India's development. That itself will create an in economic interdependence which will reduce the possibility of conflict, reduce the possibility of tension. That itself will accelerate the rate of economic growth of India. We should not only fulfill the objectives of India's development, which is needed for us, but also bring India on a power situation nearer China. It may not be equal to, that will be take 40, 50, 60 years. But that, as I said, that's not necessary for this current situation of resolving the contentious issues. And once that power balance is more equal, the contentious issues will either get resolved or they will become irrelevant. Do you know that United States and Canada have got a maritime dispute which is over, which is nearly 200 years old. It started in 1812, the War of 1812. Nobody hears of those maritime disputes because they are buried in history, but they are still alive. Some islands and creeks around Vancouver, that area. It's become irrelevant. So either they will get resolved or they will get irrelevant. But the important thing is that there will be development of India and there will be <coughs> peace on our borders. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Bhutanam. Thank you very much uh, for a very detailed expose on why China is important and how we engage. The fact that China is important not only for India as our immediate neighbor, but it's also important for the world. Uh, it is one of the largest aid giver today. Uh, perhaps it is one of the biggest source of investments. Increasingly, it's a big, becoming a great source of technology also. And of course, the Chinese government has followed a policy of investing in some really cutting edge areas, especially artificial intelligence, etc. Because they have also realized that they have to move out and move up on the global value chain and they have to retain a leadership position. The interesting point that you made was rivals as partners. And that is true, it is given examples from history. I, but I always wonder whether there was a common theme, and that common theme was US, that it was the dominant power uh, post World War, perhaps before. So all the countries which have seen phenomenal growth, including China, after Second World War, they were somehow intrinsically linked to the US economy in many, many ways. Now that is something, I guess, it needs greater uh, 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 sort of examination. 
Uh, of course, you have given us the characteristics of the Chinese, used to adversity, good learners, uh, the fact that we need, do need the uh, investments, uh, even forget about the reserves, even perhaps 10% uh, of the surplus that it gains on trade in India, that also would be a huge leap from the current cumulative investments of only $3 billion uh, from China. And mind you, all the major Chinese companies are present. Xiaomi is there, I think Lenovo is here, Hair is a household name. So these are all there and there are very many Chinese companies doing EPC contracts, particularly in our power sector, etc. But the FDI for some reason has not come, despite high level uh, engagements, promises. In fact, when uh, uh, President Xi Jinping had come to Ahmedabad, I think they were talked of $36 billion. They have been identified the corridor for high speed railways uh, to special economic zones. But we see that the high level task force that was created to follow up on the decisions, uh, when we have communicated and formulated two years, we haven't heard uh, back on who uh, will be leading it from China. So that is why I have raised this question, is it a policy decision not to invest, uh, creating as he said, the negative incentive that we will deny something to you unless you change your own behavior, we don't know yet. Uh, in trade, uh, there is, and this is anecdotal evidence, uh, businesses would know, that the respect for honoring contracts is not perhaps the strong point of a Chinese businessman. Uh, contracts have been dishonored, uh, bank guarantees have not been honored by banks, and these are serious matters which of course affect now uh, whether it happens with the rest of the world, but I know of cases, State Bank has a classic case actually, where a bank guarantee was not honored, uh, this has been raised at various levels. Uh, <coughs> I was very interested in your positive negative motivation. It's absolutely, uh, it goes without saying that nations that trade good goods and services intensively are less likely to trade in bullets uh, uh, when it comes to the crunch and they will find uh, ways to sort out. The good green shoots, in fact he talked about tourism, while it is growing it is very low but increasingly China has become a major centre uh, for Indian students and you will be perhaps surprised many of you that there are 18,000 Indian students in China today, a large majority doing uh, medicine, MBBS, because I guess the difficulties of getting into a medical school in India is also driving them. But the fact is, not only from India, from, but from ASEAN and Australia, China is drawing an increasingly large number. I am mean, told that it is already the third largest center of learning outside of the United States and UK uh, for foreign nationals, including from Africa. And that's a big thing and of course it's drawing a large number of Indian students and this trend will grow, who I hope will come back with knowledge of Chinese and also as ambassador of China here. Uh, only good thing I can tell you is that eventually everything changes, nothing is permanent. Uh, whatever we are at its strengths, uh, and he very rightly said that I don't think our policy should aim at seeking absolute pari parity or equality. That never happens between any two sets of countries. But creating the deterrence like China has the ability today to deter perhaps US uh, in its immediate neighborhood. Uh, and perhaps uh, what Dokaram showed that India also has achieved, despite the disparity in the economic strength, it does not necessarily translate into equal amount of weakness in the military strength. And Dokaram proved that point. And I think that message must have gone home uh, everywhere. So with this, well, I have just thanked the two speakers and request you to give them a big round of applause. And thank you very much. Do you want to say something? Oh, he wishes to uh, conclude. I wanted to emphasize one or two points since we are having a discussion on trade and investment for the audience. Most of the discussions that I have been part of, especially in India, talking about investment between India and China, we always talk about the same thing. Oh, it would be so great to have Chinese investment in India. I mean, they have a lot of money and we need the money because we need infrastructure. So it's a, uh, and they need to put their money somewhere. They put it in, you know, low interest bearing US bonds. Why not? Why not put it here? And we talk about we need to engage more with China in order to bring in more investment. And I'm just playing devil's advocate here and I would love for the speakers, the panelists and anyone in the audience who wants to comment on this. What does it mean to engage with someone? 
I mean, are we talking about a government to government interaction? A government to government engagement as far as investment is concerned can take the form of some sort of aid, some sort of interest free loans, development, all of that stuff. But if you want private enterprise to engage with each other, private enterprise companies which form the bulk of any uh, trade and investment relationship between any two countries, we have to create the right environment which is conducive for that uh, flow of capital to happen. I'm reminded of a story, a friend of mine who's the CEO of a very large company uh, here in India and they have a very large treasury, you know, they have a thousand crores sitting in the treasury, a lot of money and one guy goes up to him and says that, sir, I'm a wealth manager and I see that you have such a lot of money in your treasury, I know exactly what to do with it, why don't you give that money to me and I will give you great returns. And he says, my friend, if you were so smart, you would have a treasury of your own, so you don't tell me what you, what I need to do. I mean, the Chinese are smart people. They've created this huge treasury for themselves. They've created a great economy for themselves. They've created some great companies for themselves. We can't tell them that come invest in India. If it was conducive to invest in India, if it made sense, if it would make money, they would. the money would come here. I mean, there are certain challenges in our own country that we must try and solve so that the conditions are created for the money to come in. And when the conditions are right, we will not be able to stop the money from, from coming in. I mean, we need to uh, invest and build up infrastructure. Uh, you know, if infrastructure is good, tourists will come in. Uh, investment will come in, we have to create, I mean, demonstrate the size of the market by demonstrating our own companies. If our market is so large and so big, why do we not have companies which are comparable on a global scale? Let our own companies be the role model and demonstrate that we have such a big market, then other people will start coming in. Training, there was an article in The Economist recently that yes, India talks about a demographic dividend, that we have 1.2 billion people, but most of these people are perhaps not even employable, they are not even trained, they don't even have the, uh, you know, the work ethic to work so hard. So what a demographic dividend are we talking about? This is an article which came out in The Economist in early January. So, I mean, imitation is the best form of flattery. So if you want to demonstrate to other people about what they can do in our country, we have to do it in our own country first and demonstrate it. And then the money will come and then, uh, the investment and everything else, the engagement will take a, 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 a deeper a meaning. And uh, that's, that's a, just an interesting counterpoint I wanted to throw out there. And I would love to hear uh, thoughts from the panel and anyone in the audience who wants to respond to that. Good link, but wanted to say. Is this working? Yeah. Um, well, you see, uh, investment has got several dimensions. It is not only driven by incentives and uh, commercial considerations. Of course, that is a point and I fully agree with Harsh that ease of doing business is important, not only for Chinese investment, for others. But there is another factor which is very important in investment and that is the human factor. After all, investment is made by people. People make investments, they travel, there are managers who come to supervise that investment, whether it is a factory or something. There are skilled people who work there. Now, this is where there is a problem. Because in the Indian environment, Chinese people do not feel very welcome. You see our own confidence. We have a couple of people who are invited here, but who couldn't come because of visa problems. And this constantly happens uh, with Chinese. So if you want investment, the first thing you must do is make travel and visas much easier. Now, Japan has a problem with China on East China uh, Sea. Does it have a visa problem with China? No. There are 6 million Chinese tourists in Japan. There are 33,000 Chinese factories, uh, Japanese factories in China where Japanese people go and come so there are no travel problems despite the visas. Similarly in Europe, or America. So this, these are some very easy, fixable things that India should do. Say, come and at least look at our country, see the opportunities, study it, visit, tour, and then decide where you can invest. And the Chinese have a very keen in eye on investment. Not all of it is complicated. As you all know by experience, a lot of Indian God images are produced in China. Ganesh images, Durga images, with little tinkles and uh, songs. How is it done? It, it has been done because there has been a study of the Indian market by them. Very carefully. So if they can do that, they can do other things as well. So, investment is not going just with a set of tax incentives, etc. 
which of course are helpful. It means altering your mindset and it means making things easier for both parties to benefit while the benefits of the investment go to the people of India. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the prerogative of the chair is to have the last word. Uh, I entirely agree. See, the discourse and narrative in India is not positive. And I think it's true also for the Chinese media, how they present India. So the perception, the mutual perception is of antagonism, of rivals. We will have to change this narrative and send out a reassuring message that while we are competitors, there is space for both to grow. And more importantly, that India is open for Chinese and welcome. In fact, I must say that on business and tourist visas, Prime Minister Modi, despite huge resistance from the, our own security establishments, and unfortunate that we tend to see China only and mainly through the security prism, uh, rather than trade and investment uh, prism, and that needs to change. He did uh, actually made it uh, visa on uh, e-visas, uh, of course, and he's perhaps hoping to uh, make it visa on arrival, but that will really need a mindset change. And once that message goes that India is open for Chinese investments, I think things would improve. We will have to change the optics uh, of uh, how we look at each other and also the discourse. To give you concrete examples, the eight Indian banks which operate in China, uh, all are major banks. China has won. The second application for their banking operation has been doing the rounds for the last two years. Uh, and each time one agency or the other comes up with some objection, they don't have that information, this information. And these are, mind you, these are not small banks, these are huge banks, the second, third largest in the world. And they are facing these difficulties, uh, which despite the willingness of the government to move, have, has not moved. Because security, for some reason, uh, has that veto power still on many of our uh, policies. Uh, so, of course, that message. And the other good thing, and there's a school of thought, and some people have written, that some of the aggressive and expansionist behavior that you see of China, whether it's in South China Sea or across Tibet on our own borders, is also arising from the fact that China sees that the window of opportunity is closing because it has peaked in terms of the economic power. Uh, obviously, it can also see that its own behavior is creating reactions and formation of coalitions around it to uh, check uh, that uh, untrammeled expansion. So, but that window is closing and that's good news. And perhaps this is something that we also need to factor in that is this a permanent trait, a behavior, or this is something which is very momentary because it sees that there is a gap in global, or it has a Trump's uh, policies have also created that space for China to behave the way it is behaving and will that change. So with these words, uh, let me come to close this session. I think we are already delayed. Um, thank you for your patience and a big round of applause for the